Hi, my name is Gunter Eisenbach. I'm the publisher of Jamia Publications and an editor of Jamia Medical Education. I'm sitting here with Andrew Taylor, who is one of the authors of a new paper we just published about a month ago in Jamia Medical Education. And it is about ChatGPT and how ChatGPT is mastering the United States Medical Licensing Examination, USLME. This paper has also led to a call for papers, and uh, we have published an editorial on a special theme issue on the role of ChatGPT in medical education. That's why I'm thrilled to have one of the co senior authors here. Uh, Andrew, welcome to our Jamia TV channel. Um, can you first introduce yourself? So I'm Andrew Taylor. Uh, I am an emergency physician, uh, associate professor of emergency medicine at Yale University, um, also in our newly formed section of biomedical informatics and data science, and have been doing data science related uh, research for the last 10 to 15 years. What got you interested in conducting this research? I think like a lot of people with kind of some of the initial publicity around uh, chat GPT, we started trying to think about kind of what might be some of the clinical applications, you know, where we could kind of test uh, the ability of chat GPT to, to really kind of expand the medical space. And so we, I think, quickly kind of focused in on this kind of question about question and answering um, within the United States medical licensing examination and what its relative performance would be. Um, and I, I think it wasn't really, honestly, until later that we, when we were kind of digging into this, we started really realizing kind of the medical education aspect of that, um, really with this kind of component of having a, a dialogue with ChatGPT and the ability to uh, receive information back and to then further ask questions from it. Uh, and that I think that kind of continued kind of some of the research questions and I think spurred on a little bit more exploration as we are going through the research project. Mm -hmm. And I understand some of your authors are also medical students. Right, right, yeah. So actually four of the authors are medical students. Uh, one is also a, a PhD in, in bioinformatics, uh, a PhD candidate. That was, I think, another reason why there was an interest in this space. Um, and I think it really was helpful trying to understand, you know, what their experiences were currently with kind of the education process, how they were you know, currently doing studying, uh, I think they more quickly recognized than I did the medical examination process for, for many years, you know, what kind of applications this might have within that space. Um, so I think that was a really nice kind of collaboration opportunity where we were really able to get some insights from that. And one of the medical students was even starting to kind of go through some of the question answering and had was just coming into medical school and felt like, you know, seeing the tool and how it you know, potentially could be used allowed us to be able to see what potential applications were, were there for the future. Yeah. How would you summarize the main findings of this paper? So we used uh, ChatGPT for those people that may not know kind of the full name is this chat generative pre-trained transformer. It's a large language model. Uh, most people will probably be familiar with like a, you know, common name of like a deep learning model. And we use several data sets that were meant to be reflective of kind of the medical licensureship uh, examination. Um, some of those came from the National Board of Medical Examiners. Some of them came from AMBOSS, which is also another uh, platform to be able to do kind of question answering uh, for medical students. Uh, and we use ChatGBT and then also two other large language models that didn't have this dialogic component to it. So GPT-3 and instruct GPT to look at their performance and uh, do comparisons between them and chat GPT. And then obviously we knew kind of what the correct answers were from the two uh, examination data sets. And what we found was that, you know, based on the performance of chat GPT, and looking at kind of historic benchmarks for performance on those examinations that 
you know, if you do that comparison, it, it was you know, hitting about the same kind of question answering accuracy um, at around kind of a third year medical student level. I think, but more importantly, maybe from a medical education standpoint, you know, there was, because of that kind of dialogic aspect to it, there were, you know, clear kind of rationales or reasoning for why it was providing a particular answer. And I think on further kind of examination about the logical components of it and some other kind of response aspects of it, we were able to kind of, I think, at least get a sense of, you know, how it might have applications for future medical education uh, initiatives as well. Uh, and as I mentioned before about one of the medical students, I think it was quite clear that in working through this, he was able to then ask kind of further uh, iterative questions off the initial questions and then dive deeper into kind of knowledge areas, uh, which we thought was kind of a very interesting potential application moving forward, kind of this idea of a, an AI kind of based tutor system or kind of, you know, pair uh, or peer buddy uh, for educational purposes. Yeah, so I mean, the accuracy of ChatGPT in answering medical questions, I think that is something that where we're going to see a lot more papers coming in on. And uh, I think what's special about your paper is also you didn't only look at ChatGPT, but also compare this against other large language models, as you mentioned, instruct GPT and GPT-3. How would you describe to a relative layperson what the differences between those language models are? Yeah, I mean, I think the main the main difference really with chat GPT and the other language models is this um, additional component of kind of dialogue that's been driven by a lot of prior training for question answering data sets. So, you know, there were while there were performance differences, and I think we highlighted this in the the text. Even if the performance differences between ChatGPT and InstructGPT and GPT three hadn't been significant, the the difference that you receive kind of on as from a user perspective is that you get a lot of additional information that's provided with the you know the answer that's being provided. You know, it's choosing this answer. It's telling you why it's potentially choosing this answer. It's pulling in external information. Uh, that wasn't, you know, available within the question itself. And I think, you know, for for students as they're coming through, that can be you know, extremely helpful. When I was going through medical school, you, you're doing some of these question answering kind of data sets and going through and you, you know, you may get the answer, but you, you know, if you don't get any other information about, uh, you know, why that answer is correct, and you definitely don't have the ability to really dig in and then say, okay, well, I understand this fact, but tell me more about this part of it and everything else. And so to me, that's that's the real main difference in the models, uh, I, I think from a from definitely from a user perspective. And there are a lot of other studies coming out in other fields as well, purporting that ChatGPT can also pass all sorts of other exams, like yes, uh, yes. business or even interview with uh, at Google for engineers and stuff like that. The findings of this study have been reported sometimes in the media as, as saying ChatGPT can pass a medical exam. Um, would you agree with that characterization of finding of the paper, or is that a little bit over the top? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I think there is some over the top component of that. So one one of the caveats to all of this is that for the prompts for ChatGPT, they need to be very structured, um, and so. You know, initially when we were going through, we had to remove questions that were, you know, had images associated with them that had, you know, significant kind of tabular data or formatted data that was not just general text. So there's that aspect to begin with that, you know, it's not capable at that point and wouldn't be able to, I think, answer those questions. Um, and the other thing is we, you know, also didn't look at USMLE 3, which is kind of the third stage for medical licensure examination. And, and a lot of that was because it was more focused on uh, clinical practice than kind of foundational knowledge for this. You know, it's, it's hard to know. If, could you run it and you know, give it a score and, and then suspect that it was going to pass? I would say it's, if you were, had done what we did and removed those types of questions, I'd say yes, but I think, you know, obviously there's 
a lot of caveats to that. And it's not something that's going to be able to be used in a kind of a real-time decision-making environment, at least at this point. Uh, so it's we're nowhere near replacement or anything else, at least at this point. And not to forget, I mean, in most countries, the medical exam doesn't only consist of a theoretical kind of multiple choice test, but you also have to prove that you're a good clinician and that you can interact with the patient, right? At least in yes, yeah. Germany, when I did that, I had to prove that as well, in addition to a theoretical test. So right. I agree with you. It's it's perhaps a little bit over the top, but um, it is at least interesting uh, how much knowledge one can extract from GPT. How do you see, in general, the future of medical education and, and the role of ChatGPT or more generally artificial intelligence in medical education and perhaps even medical practice? I see tools like this being used more frequently as we move forward as some type of tutor, some type of you know, querying service where students are really able to kind of ask questions and dig in and get explanations from you know, chat GPT-like uh, services moving forward. I use it in a lot of other spaces. So, uh, you know, one frequent thing that I use ChatGPT for now is in even in coding practices. Like, it's very easy to, you know, ask about, you know, how do I write this function? I need to do this particular thing in Python or something else. And you can get stuff like that out of it. So I, I think we'll see more and more of that type of use. And I, you know, I only expect that these things will get better uh, as we move forward. It's going to be interesting to see in general, like medical practice, how this is, is used and moved into the space. I mean, one limitation, at least in the United States at this point, is that it's hard to incorporate these types of systems into existing EHR uh, environments. Um, at least I haven't seen anything so far, but I, I can't see how we wouldn't want to necessarily you know, do some of these types of things moving forward. Like one clear example from the emergency medicine space is even like in discharge instruction. So it's not hard to ask you know, chat GPT and these types of things to be able to summarize information for a particular discharge, let's say around chest pain or something else, at uh, you know a fourth grade level or a twelfth grade level, or you know describe it in this technical way, or you know provide this type of information, uh, and, you know additional to what we're already providing. So I, I definitely see that part of it being extremely helpful, and and I wonder if there's you know an ability also to really turn it on the system and then not just you know query external knowledge, but be able to query kind of system knowledge and help, you know, in healthcare knowledge and then ask questions. I would personally love to see, you know, some type of agent where I can ask standard language you know, questions, you know, tell me, you know, what's the history on this patient? What medications are they on? And then I get, you know, very clear kind of prompt and the information that's coming out of that. But I still think, yeah, I think we're a couple of years away from that for sure. Yeah. And I mean, this would also require pretty closed systems, right? Because privacy is certainly an issue. Right. So right now, even ChatGPT warns you from not entering any private data there because it's, it's all stored and sometimes even reviewed by humans as far as I understand that. So you should certainly not plug in a discharge summary of a right. patient with, with all the patient names and so in there. I actually, I wrote this editorial, uh, which is an interview with ChatGPT, where I also asked the AI to come up with some ideas on what the role of medical education is. And I tested then the capabilities of ChatGPT to, to deliver on these promises. And the results were quite positive. So what ChatGPT suggested is to virtual patients, like simulated patients with certain conditions, you can simulate how, for example, a diabetes patient would come into the practice and what they would say. Uh, and uh, you can even like, refine your patient doctor patient communication. So I plug, for example, in a explanation for a patient and ask ChatGPT to critique it. So that was all pretty um, interesting. And I, I also actually 
try to test the this, this was not in this paper, but I, I tested a little bit the, the quality by replicating some of the older studies that we have seen when the World War Web came up like uh, 25 years ago, because uh, I, I feel like it's it's we're gonna be faced with the same kind of questions again, like what's the quality, how does this change the patient doctor relationship? And end of the 90s, there the first studies came out. Uh, for example, the 1997 paper published in the BMJ by Vichy Tor about fever management at home, and then they tested what the World Wide Web would deliver. And I, I kind of replicated that. And ChatGPT was in general, I mean, on par or, or better than uh, what also found when they just Googled around on the World Wide Web. But what I personally find uh, a risk here is that if if you plug something in a browser and search for information, then at least you know where it's coming from. Right? And yes. uh, you, even though we have also done some research where we saw that consumers at the end of the day are not very good in checking the sources uh, and, and assessing the credibility of the sources, but if they still can see, okay, this is a recommendation by some association or this is from some website that sells stuff, right? So this is perhaps where I see a little bit the risk of uh, using ChatGPT to kind of Google uh, facts. We have to come up with a new verb here, ChatGPT facts. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, I totally agree with you. And I think there's honestly a lot of probably active research in this area where people are you know, actively doing retrieval type uh, information and, and building and incorporating those into these large language models. Um, my son had a geography study uh, project the other day, and he was looking up health characteristics for uh, different countries. And so I, I um, had him look at them and he was actively searching on the internet and Googling things. And it was, you know, like gross domestic product, uh, life expectancy for this country and that country. And, you know, I asked chat GPT at the same time to break down those things. And, you know, the, the answers were close, but I think to your point, like you don't know because you don't have that source to be able to go back to and say, this information was taken from here or there and you know it's some type of like probabilistic type number that's being generated off of it uh, but it, it did kind of highlight that need for having source information in the future and I think that goes back to the medical education front is I think we have to be a little bit careful with these systems as medical even medical tutor tutors and other stuff at this point until you really can link into that source information and say, oh, this is coming from this textbook or this website. Uh, and then I think there'll be a lot more kind of credence to the answers that are being provided. Yeah, I mean, what I found particularly disturbing as a publisher and editor was that ChatGPT is actually making up references, inventing references yeah. that do not exist. I think that's a well-known problem, but I encountered that as well because I asked ChatGPT to tell me a highly cited paper in published in Jamie and Medical Education and to critique it. And it just completely made up a paper. I, I was unable to find this neither in Jamie or Medical Education nor in other Jamie journal, nor in, in PubMed. So it, this, it doesn't exist. So it was completely hallucinating. And this, this yeah. uh, phenomenon of AI hallucination, that's actually a technical term, right? Did, did <laughs> you come across any similar kind of really disturbing I, misinformation? Not when we were doing this and looking at the questions, but I, I actually ran into a very similar uh, scenario in some of my kind of initial exploration with the tool. I asked it to summarize or provide a you know, scientifically oriented paper on uh, opioid use disorder. And it's a it's an area that our uh, emergency department is um, known for studying and doing research on. And it, you know, created a, a fairly nice summary component to the paper and everything else, but it did exactly what you're referencing. It even referenced some of the people in our department 
but the rest of the reference was completely made up. You could see how it was just pulling in probabilistic information from uh, from other areas, but was just totally making it up. So I agree. That, that's a it's a problem, and I think will only be solved. I think as we make these requirements to have kind of some type of source uh, grounding to a lot of this information um, and the way that it's provided. Yeah, and there's certainly more work to be done and specifically training ChatGPT on peer-reviewed literature and uh, perhaps even connecting connecting ChatGPT with more like structured databases, which are out there like, like PubMed and, and Crossref so that these kind of errors don't happen. Do you have any other uh, concluding remarks or call to action? What kind of work would you like to come out in the future? Uh, or perhaps also you personally, are you going to pursue this line of work? What, what are you working on right now? Yeah, no, uh, yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, I think as I kind of had referenced before, my interest is, you know, how we could potentially use tools like this in the healthcare system to deliver, you know, better and more effective care. And I, I think we're going to explore you know, potential avenues for that. And I would love to see, you know, further development of this in the medical kind of edu education space. And I think we will, so that, you know, becomes from a student kind of learning standpoint, it becomes much more dynamic that kind of learning process uh, and they're really able to kind of leverage this te technology to kind of push themselves forward. Cause I, you know, I think we're going to see more and more in students using these types of tools and you know, being potentially kind of separated or not in a traditional kind of educational environment. And so I think these are great, you know, avenues to kind of push things forward. Thank you for that. And I have to say, I mean, in my lifetime, I have, seen perhaps like three major disruptions uh, or tectonic shifts. Uh, one was the invention of the World Wide Web and the browser, which really made, made internet accessible, more accessible. Internet was already existing before the World Wide Web, but uh, it made it consumer accessible. And then the emergence of, of mobile phones, smartphones, mobile house, um, COVID, also has a had a disruptive yeah. effect and accelerated many of the digital technologies and also disrupted medical education. And I think this ChatGPT in the rapid growth also that that application has experienced, like I think we had a hundred million now, and that was like hundred million users four months after the launch. It's the fastest yeah. growing consumer application. So to make AI for the first time really so accessible to the end consumer. I think that is a major disruption uh, for all fields, um, but in particular, of course, also medicine, where it is particularly important that we get the facts straight and that you know, people are not exposed to misinformation. And uh, yeah, ChatGPT is not bad in that category, but there's also still a lot to do, I think. Thank you very much for your thoughts on this. And, yeah, uh, thank you very much for having me. And keep submitting to Jamie. We're probably going to yeah. publish a ton of other pap papers on uh, ChatGPT and um, the call for papers for the theme issue on ChatGPT and more generative AI in medical education because there are also other generative tools sure. like Im image uh, applications where you can right. generate images and so on. So. All this will disrupt medical education a lot. And as publisher uh, specialized in digital health, we are obviously very interested in these kinds of papers. Thank you very much. Cool. Thank you. Don't forget to follow us and click the notification button if you want to be informed of new content.